Uh, Vladimir Vajda is here with us. Vlado, just another public thank you for the Unconference contribution last night. How did you like the concept? Well, that was the first uh, an Unconference event in which I participated, and yeah, Astu. it was a <laughs> bit strange, so uh, hard to tell which topics would uh, people like when mm. I was in a situation to yeah. appoint topics, and, but it went really interesting and it was mm. quite well. Yeah, it turned out great. I mean, the feedback with your session was also good. So, yeah, thanks once again for that. So the floor is yours. And uh, uh, I think, yeah, that uh, uh, people will really dig what you have to say here because, you know, last night was so good. I hope so. Yeah, thanks. Hi. Thank you, everyone, for, for having me here. Um, today I would like to share my experience on working with event source, event driven and event sourcing architectures. So. Um, some of you might have been using the event sourcing or event driven architectures, some of you might not. I hope uh, this talk would have, a, a, would, would have something useful for, for both of you. So um, the talk is about query pattern in the microservice architecture and how you, how you solve that. To better explain the concepts and the ideas, I would uh, use an example of a bookshop application in this talk. So uh, imagine you have a bookshop application which has an account and a uh, balance state where you can withdraw and deposit money. You can order a book or buy a book and the money will be uh, taken from your balance account and book will be shipped to your home address. So a simple web, web shop application. In this uh, case it's a bookshop. If you want to split this to microservice architecture, which is request-driven, uh, probably the standard way you do it. You would have UI front-end and back-end, um, th which communicate one with one another through the REST API or web sockets. And you would have probably an inventory service to look up for the available books. You would have an account service. You would use it for information about user and the balance, and you would probably have some kind of shipping service to, to do the shipping of the book. Uh, I will go to uh, several concepts and ideas here and to see how this architecture behaves. So uh, the first one is location. In this architecture, you need to know the location of other services from the point of view of the UI backend. So when your UI backend communicates to the, to the um, account service or the shipping service, it needs to know where it's located. So it needs to know its AP address or it needs to know DNS name or if it does not know that, it needs to know the some kind of uh, address of discovery service or you need to have an API gateway to solve this problem. This brings us to the second uh, idea is a service pluggability. In this architecture, if you want to ad introduce additional service, for example, reporting service or some machine learning service which will do the uh, recommendation for particular books. You need to change the code of your UI backend to send particular additional information or request to this new service you're introducing to the system. Also, if you want to remove particular service, for example, your application now uh, is not doing the shipping anymore. You're not selling the physical books, only the e-books and you don't want to have a shipping service in your application anymore, you need to change your code not to request, send any request to the shipping service. So in order to ad add additional service or remove additional service from your system, you need to change the code of particular, of particular applications in your, in your, in your system. Uh, the third point is high availability. In this architecture, to solve, to solve this problem, you probably want to introduce at least two instances of, of the same service. So if one fails, you have another. And in order to spread the load between those, you will probably introduce some kind of load balancer. Uh, the fourth point is load handling. Uh, we already seen on some other talks here. So um, when you, for example, have a peak load in a particular time of the day, your application cannot handle all the requests. It can uh, go down, you'll maybe rece receive uh, service unavailable or uh, 
or something else, or maybe just the request will be will be dropped out. And the fifth point is the responsibility. This is the most important part. So <coughs> this kind of uh, architecture has the responsibility on the UI backend side. So the UI backend asks for the information and UI backend commands a particular service. So it asks the inventory service for the available books and commands the shipping service to do the shipping. So all the responsibility and all the knowledge is in the UI backend service, which leads to a tight coupling of your uh, services in, the, in your architecture. So um, this is something that I was, I, I, I'm working and I was working for a couple of months now and uh, can this be, be done better? Um, yeah. Uh, I'm Vladimir Vaida and I work as a data engineer in a smart cat. We do the big data stuff, distributed systems and architectures. So uh, how can we do this better? Uh, we can do the event-driven architecture. We can have also the, the same approach for the UI backend and frontend, but now the UI backend will not communicate directly to the, any of the other services, but will send the messages or events to the event bus, and all other services will collect the information from the event bus. So event bus can be any technology for the messaging, uh, RabbitMQ, uh, Kafka, ActiveMQ, there are other also. Uh, let us go to the, to the five points we already did in the request-driven architecture and see how this microservice architecture behaves. Uh, first location. So uh, your, your UI backend service now does not need to know the location of the account service or the shipping service. It sends the information to the event bus and that's all. Uh, having said that, uh, we have the service plugability already uh, already done. So um, if you want to introduce additional service to your system, you just plug it to the particular event bus and have it listen to particular events and the service will, will do the job. You don't need to change the code of the particular service. So let's, for example, you want to have the reporting. Your UI backend will still do the same job send all the events it sends to the event bus, and your reporting service will just start to listen to particular events and do something with that. So uh, you don't need to change the code of your UI backend. Uh, the third, uh, high availability. In this kind of architecture, each service actually does not receive the requests for, uh, from other services or from the UI or, or the front end, but you actually pull the new message or event from the event bus, and process it with the speed you can, and after you process it, you might, might create additional event, you might not, but after you process it, you will then take another one, and so on. So you, you have a control over the speed you, you, you do the processing. And if you have, uh, sorry, that, that was for the load, load handling, for the high availability, you actually have multiple instances, but uh, you don't have any load balancing here but because your event bus system will just split the load through the multiple instances. So back to load handling. So your service takes all the information uh, at the speed that it can. So if you have a peak load in your system, for example, uh, your service will not go down. You will just have increased latency. Of course, that's not good stuff, but it's probably better than to have service unavailable. And the fifth more, most important uh, idea here is responsibility. So now your uh, UI backend does not know that other services exist at all. So UI backend just sends the inf information events to the event bus and all other services has, have the responsibility to do something with events of, of interest for them. So the responsibility of the shipping service is to know that it needs to react on a particular event and to do the shipping after that. And it's not the responsibility of your UI backend to know that some kind of shipping service exists somewhere and to do the shipping there. Uh, having said all this, <coughs> uh, there are still some challenges in this kind of architecture and those are uh, mostly to the communication between the services. So. Um, before we start with that, there are three types of communication between the services you can have. First is event. Event is just an 
a statement of the current state of the system that you want to announce and have other services know about. A command. Command is, uh, example of command is uh, ship this book. Command is just an order you want to send to other service uh, to, do, to do. And the third one is the query. Query is when you want to pull information from other service to present it to the user or uh, make a decision based on that information. And <coughs> query is the most problematic one. So I will just first explain how you map events and commands and then we'll go to the query. In the request-driven architecture, when you want to have the event between two <coughs> services, you just create a request which is actually represents an event. For example, in this case, book order event, and that's all. And in the event-driven architecture, you would do the same, but you will just send this event to the event bus, not directly to the particular service. Then the service will have the responsibility to know and to listen to the particular event <coughs> and to react in that one. Uh, the command pattern is a bit different. Um, in the request-driven architecture, you'll probably send uh, ship this book order uh, to the shipping service, and shipping service will do the rest of the job. But in the event-driven architecture, you need to, to change the paradigm a bit, so you need to, to flip uh, responsibilities. Uh, your UI backend does not know that you have uh, shipping service in your system at all. So it cannot uh, send anything like ship this book because that does not make sense. <coughs> all the UI backend knows is that uh, the book has been ordered. So he can announce a uh, book has been ordered to the event bus and then the responsibility of the shipping service is to know that it needs to listen on this book ordered event and react by doing the real shipping. So this already here uh, changes paradigm a bit and makes uh, those two services loosely coupled instead of uh, tightly coupled. Uh, the third most problematic part is the query. Uh, if you have UI backend and inventory service and you want, for example, in this request your own architecture to have um, standard uh, request to get inventory info, for example, available books, you would just send a request and the service will return you the, the information. Uh, before we go to the, uh, how we map the query to the event-driven architecture, uh, I want to tell you that there are situations when you think you need actually the query pattern, but um, you actually can avoid it, and it's best to avoid it if you can. A situation would be, for example, when you, in the UI backend, <coughs> uh, ask the inventory service for particular available books. Uh, inventory service uh, returns you the response, and then you make a decision based on this. So you check if book is available or not, or, and make some decision. So uh, this is not a good approach. As the inventory service has all the information needed, we should let the inventory service do the uh, all, all decision making. So we'll just send a book ordered event and inventory service will have the responsibility to <coughs> consume the event. If there's no available books, it will create a book unavailable event and then UI backend should has the responsibility to listen to all the book unavailable events in order to present to the user. So this is a way to actually to, to avoid having a query if you can, but there are still situations when you cannot avoid it. For example, if you need uh, multiple information for multiple services to <coughs> to make some decision or you need a, for example, balanced state to present it to, to, your, uh, to your user on the UI. Uh, this is something you cannot avoid. So you need actually to, to have this query information from other services. The first approach <coughs> is the shared database. So uh, instead of asking the inventory service for particular information, which will uh, be further pulled from the inventory database, uh, why not ask the uh, inventory database um, from your UI backend? So this might sound like a good idea, but actually it's not, because uh, this way um, we, <coughs> we break the encapsulation of the inventory database. So if you have the database within one microservice, you want to, to 
to guard and close all these technical details of your storage format and database within that service and provide only access to the API of particular service. If you, if you don't do that, if you, for example, contact the uh, inventory database directly from your UI backend, uh, that can lead to a coupling to the data format with the inventory service. For example, let's say we have one table in the inventory uh, database that both services are accessing, and there are new feature uh, that's being developed in the inventory service, which changes this schema. Uh, we do the deploy uh, of the inventory service, do the deploy of the database schema, and now our UI backend is bro broken. So. Uh, in this situation, we'll have a problem that we um, tightly couple deployments of two, two services, which is, which is a bad thing. So uh, this approach is something that's considered an anti-pattern in the microservice architecture. So database should always be the encapsulated within the particular service, and you guard that internal storage with the API. So this... Um, leaves you a way that you can change database implementation, uh, you can change the schema. If you still have the same API, no one, no one else will notice. So uh, this is something that you should avoid having uh, the shared database. Uh, the second approach is the remote query. So um, that is something that's actually uh, similar to the request-driven approach. We would have two services which you would send requests to the second service and receive the response. But as we saw already that in this uh, request driven architecture, we need to introduce uh, service discovery, load balancing and stuff like that in order to communicate. We can do the request response to the event bus. So we can just send a particular request or event to the one service. Service will react to that answer and we'll receive the response to our service. So um, this is actually emulating the request driven uh, and request response approach to the events uh, driven architecture. Uh, this uh, leads to a tight coupling between services, but um, that's one way to do it. Uh, the third way <coughs> is to have event carried state transfer. So uh, we have this two services, and let's say that each update on the inventory service um, is sent to the database, but also we create an update event and send it to the event bus. So every update <coughs> that can happen on the inventory service also ends up on the event bus. That way, we can uh, listen to this event on the UI backend and create our, our additional new table in the UI backend database and save this information there. So when we need uh, to query, we actually don't query the inventory service, we have all the information in our local state. So this way we actually avoid uh, having query at all. So uh, we saw three approaches, shared database, event carried state transfer, and remote query. Uh, as shared database is a no-go, uh, I would discuss those two and see uh, how they um, behave and what are they good for. <coughs> so first, uh, if you do the event carry state transfer and copy your information on the other service, you have duplication of data. If you have a lot of data, well, that's a lot of data to duplicate and it can, you can have problems with resources and uh, network and all other problems which comes with a lot of data. Uh, second problem if, is uh, when you have a duplicated data is data consistency. So uh, you, you have problems of auto, auto atomic uh, writes. How do you make uh, changes on both sides atomic and, and stuff like that? Uh, well, there, there are solutions for that. Uh, the third problem is uh, latency. In the event carry state transfer, latency is really low, but if you use the remote query, latency will be high because you need a network hop to access another service and uh, pro if you use the <coughs> event bus, it's probably another network hop and so on. Uh, data autonomy. <coughs> if you use the remote query, the data 
uh, is in the format that is in the particular service you're asking, and it might be in the format that's not well suited for your needs, but it's well suited for that service that, that owns the data. And if you uh, recreate the state with events your, your locally on your service, you can have totally different schema. You can have uh, already some multiple tables uh, joined in one table. So uh, you have this autonomy to do uh, and make the format of data the way you want. And that will also improve the latency since you will probably uh, query this information much faster than uh, asking the, the other service and pulling it from other database. This also uh, gets uh, multiplied if you have multiple service data joins. For example, you need to contact two or three services, uh, collect all those data and do some decision making there. Uh, in this, uh, in a remote query, that could uh, be, so probably it will take a long and it will, it is error prone. So if one service is done, you have a problem. But in the event carriage state transfer, you listen to the events of all the services and you you can join um, the information as you receive the particular event and save it to the table in that way. So you can have data already joined and ready for you to query it in easy way. API versioning. Uh, when you have the local state, uh, you don't have any query, you don't have any API uh, between the services, so your data is locally and you don't have a problem with API versioning. But if you're using remote query, uh, you need to have an API between two services, and when you have an API, you'll probably end up having API versioning uh, requests uh, as you further go further with your application development. So what are the conclusions here? Uh, there is no silver bullet. So <clears throat> in some situations, uh, remote query is okay, in some situations, local state, event, event state, events carry state transfer is okay. So, for example, if you have a lot of data, you would probably want to use uh, remote query if you just one query. Um, if you have small data, it's probably easier for you to duplicate it to, to create events and create local state. If data has a high velocities and is um, fast changing, then it's easier for you to do the uh, replication with events because it's uh, much trickier to have a caching when your data is fast changing. Uh, but if data is not changing fast, you can use the remote query. Uh, know your requirements and weigh out the options. Uh, you need to, to know your system and choose wisely which, which approach to take uh, depending on, the, on your requirements. <coughs> and third, uh, make a decision and don't stick to it. So this is software. Uh, try one solution. If it does not work for, for a week or a month, uh, go back to the drawing board and rethink and uh, change and take, tr try another one. So uh, that was all. Thank you. <laughs> if you have any questions, I will gladly to answer. Uh, just a quick question. You mentioned, for example, communication in two services and all principles that you shown here. But what if you have communication with something like payment provider and you need some webhook to say, okay, I finished my transaction here and then return them back? Well, you can always model that as an uh, array of an events. So uh, if, you if you have a payment provider, you probably receive a particular events from your payment provider. They're probably just like a web hooks, but you can have some kind of a web server which will just uh, put those information as an event to a particular in event bus. And then you have other services that consume that and build a particular state, whether uh, the payment is still pending or is already finished and so on. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so you mentioned a bit about uh, data consistency. You said that it's a, a solved problem. So what are some means to ensure the data consistency between updates and propagating those updates to uh, events to the uh, replicated data? 
So if you have a event driven, so I make actually a, some kind of a distinction between event driven e and event sourcing. Um, to me, event driven is just communicating services through the events, but still keeping uh, the state in the format of uh, some kind of database, a relational database, or any other way. So you have only the snapshot, but in, in event sourcing way, you actually uh, keep all your events uh, in storage, and you can always go to the, from the beginning to the end to recreate the state. And if you uh, use the event sourcing to have all the information in the events, uh, you can have, for example, if you want, uh, I will give you an example, if you have Elasticsearch, for example, for um, searching, and you have some kind of uh, database relational that you actually uh, uh, query for additional information, you want to keep those in sync because the search and the database needs to have all the information the same. You can have uh, one service that listens to this uh, particular events and updates the Elastic, and one service that uh, listens to the events and updates the database. So you would have probably eventual consistency, you would not have the uh, strong consistency in this case. Thank you.